you would, turn over to the fourth chapter of the book of Zechariah, and we will begin there. Before we begin, though, let's have a short prayer. And Father, we pray that bless us as we engage in the study of thy word. We pray, Father, we may have a greater insight into thy will for us, into the, thy character and what we may expect of the, the things of this life and how we may rely upon that word to sustain us in, in spite of all the adversity that this life presents us. We pray that continue to bless us as we study and that we may be a blessing to those around about us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We had just uh, concluded uh, chapter 3 when it was speaking of the uh, the branch. I'm bringing forth my servant, the branch. And of course that's uh, messianic in, in nature. And the branch is called various places, rod, root, uh, 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 root of Jesse and, and other things too but when we get down into chapter 6 we'll uh, speak more extensively about uh, this branch but we'll wait till we get there here in, in the fourth chapter we have the, the fifth vision and it says now the angel who talked with me came back and, and awakened me as a man who is wakened out of his sleep, well, he either was asleep or it wasn't, but it had that uh, feeling that he was just waking out of sleep. And he said to me, uh, what do you see? And if you want to do an interesting study, study all the angels that are spoken of here and try to figure out which one's speaking. It's uh, difficult sometimes. And he said to me, what do you see? So I said, I'm looking and there is a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it and on the stand seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. Now here's a, a interesting aspect of this uh, vision about the uh, uh, lampstand. This is not like the lampstand of the tabernacle nor is it like the lampstand that was carried off into to Babylon when Babylon came in. This lampstand has, uh, well, it's got seven lamps. That's that's typical of uh, a lamp, a lampstand. But it's got a bowl on top. So that must mean the bowl is attached to the lampstand somehow or another. But it's got seven pipes going to the seven lamps. But the uh, question is, is there one pipe going to each lamp? The American Standard says seven lamp, seven pipes to each lamp. So we don't know. <laughs> we don't know exactly how, how it looks. I went online and tried to find a uh, a depiction of of uh, Zachariah's lamp, and nobody seems to know what it, <laughs> what it looks like. It was very difficult to. Uh, configure the lamp, especially uh, the ASV lamp. And some may say that the lamp was, you know, the the actual the wicks that are burning are in a circle with this bowl in the center. But uh, that would be a very unusual lamp. The fact of the matter is, when you come to a vision like this, you don't have to have a visual representation of what the lamp looks like. That's not the purpose of the, the vision, is to uh, convey some message. And so whether we can uh, depict it graphically or not, doesn't matter. You can have it look any way you want to when it comes to a vision. <laughs> That's the nature of visions. But anyway, he says uh, the seven lamps, seven pipes to the seven lamps. I think the King James uh, has one pipe to each lamp, but on the ASV has seven pipes to each of the lamps. But also there are two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl, and the other at the left of the bowl. 
So I, I uh, answered uh, and spoke to the angel and talked to me, saying, What are these, my Lord? The angel who talked to me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. And he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. And you have to keep in mind what, what was the lampstand, the symbolic nature of the lampstand in the uh, uh, temple. And it always provided light. Uh, there's always light in the uh, temple. It was placed in the holy place, not the holy of holies, but the holy place. So it's the idea that, uh, you know, the, the holiness of the, of the uh, light that that uh, God provides, you know, uh, we are the light of the world, that, that sort of deal. So it's, it has the idea that those who are faithful to God will always project light. So he says, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. Now, might uh, uh, has to do with, uh, you know, force of arms, and, you know, strength. And power is uh, the power inherent in the uh, military powers and what have you, or strength of arms, force of arms. So that's not going to be whatever he's going to tell Zerubbabel. It's not going to be by that, but it's going to be by his spirit. So whatever it is that uh, he's talking about here, it's going to be done by his spirit, the spirit of Jehovah, by his power and might, not by the power or might of man. And he says, Who are you, O great mountain? Now you think... think uh, you know, this is a vision, so you can use your vision to think of a huge mountain, and it's a pretty significant object. If you were, uh, I know that back in pioneer times when they were traveling from the east coast to the west coast, the mountains were a significant obstacle to their passage to the west coast. So it's a formidable uh, object, and so that's what it's conveying here. A great mountain is a uh, formidable uh, object to the accomplishment of the task at hand. But before Zerubbabel, now it's not because of his own might or his own power, but by the Lord's Spirit, before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain. The mountain is no longer an obstacle one. When it's a, uh, a plan and and uh, uh, something that the Lord has accomplished, these significant objects are no obstacle at all. His plan and purpose will be fulfilled. He says, "You'll become a plain. This mountain, you'll become a plain, and he that's a rubber bowl shall bring forth." A capstone. Now, see, somebody talked about uh, uh, not capstone, but uh, cornerstone, didn't he? A capstone is not a cornerstone. Cornerstone, and of course, uh, we're talking about the temple here, uh, rebuilding the temple. Cornerstone had already been laid, you know, 16 years prior to this time. So when not talking about the cornerstone, I'm talking about the capstone, the thing that finishes it off, the capstone. So the rubber bowl is going to bring forth the capstone. He's going to finish the temple with shouts of grace and grace to it. That's favor, favor to the uh, accomplishment of this rebuilding of the, of the uh, temple. In verse 8, moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple, which he had, and his hands shall also finish it, which he did. 
then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Now the you is the rubble, and me is the Lord. So if you, when you accomplish this, you will know that I sent you to do this, this uh, work. For who has despised the day of small things? You might look at Ezra 3.12. They, they considered the, uh, this temple to be uh, not nearly as glorious as Solomon's temple. And it probably, in terms of uh, appearance sake and what have you, it may not have appeared as glorious as Solomon's temple. And it may not have been as glorious as Herod's temple. That, that was to come later. But... Still, it was something that was commissioned by God. And when it's commissioned by God, it is not a small thing. So whatever, the, uh, whatever God has enjoined upon us, it is not a small thing. It is an important thing. And it's, uh, we should see that we uh, accomplishment, accomplish it. For these seven rejoice to see. And that's the, you can go back to... Uh, uh, chapter 3, verse 9, talking about the seven eyes. That's the seven that he's talking about here. For these seven rejoice to see it. The plumb line in the hand of uh, Zerubbabel. That's what he, these seven eyes rejoice to see. And a plumb line is an instrument of construction. So using the plumb line, and as Eric pointed out, you know, you. you use a cornerstone to line the, the structure and uh, to uh, you know you can get the side of the wall but whether it's straight up and down you have to use plumb line to do it so it has the idea of construction the seven they are the eyes of the Lord who scan which scan to and fro throughout the whole earth which means that uh, the Lord, He carries out His purpose or plan, whatever it may be. He's going to carry it out. In verse 11, uh, Zechariah said, Then I answered and said to him, What are these two olive trees, one at the right of the lampstand and the other at the left? Remember, the lampstands provide uh, continuous light. And I further answered and said to him, What are these two olive branches that drip into the receptacles of the two gold pipes from which the golden oil drains? So uh, Zechariah doesn't, doesn't wait for the angel to answer. He asked the second, a second question right away in a different way, but still essentially the same thing. Then he answered me and said, Do you not know what... These are, and I said, No, my Lord. He said, These are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. Now, the, the uh, representations that I've seen of the lamps, whatever the lampstand looks like, got two olive trees on each side with limbs hanging over the bowl and the oil dripping, the olive oil dripping into the bowl. Now, the last time I checked, olives don't drip oil, <laughs> they have to be squashed and squeezed and but this is a vision you know this can happen in a vision it doesn't have to follow uh any, you know commercial procedures for extracting olive oil so but the idea is that this uh, lamp will be continuously supplied with olive oil it will not go out but who are the two anointed ones who stand beside the lord on the whole earth well, in the uh, Old Testament, there are only in the in the uh, uh, religious or the nation of Israel. There, there's only two people that would be anointed, and one would be the, the high priest. When you know he's made high priest, he was anointed with oil, and the other was the king. When he's made king, he was anointed with with oil. But there's no king at this time, and uh, Joshua's the, the priest at this time. But, you know, Zerubbabel, he's the governor, so he, he may be in the place of the king, 
may be referring to him and, of course, Joshua, the high priest. But also, if it was just a king and a high priest that's anointed, this would have messianic implications because who is now our king and high priest? It's Jesus Christ himself. So those two offices are now combined into one, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So certainly this is at least implies that there will be an anointing one. He's going to stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. He's going to be in control of the whole earth. Yes. Yeah, that's right. But prior to this time, you know, the, the king was never the uh, high priest, and was never uh, the, the high priest was never the king. And yeah, you know, there may have been, uh, they may have had aspects of, of prophecy, and you know, being some priests that were also prophets. But in terms of Yeah, that's right. But, but here we're talking about the anointing. You know, the prophets weren't anointed. So here we're talking about the anointing with the oil. But you're right. Uh, but the office, the, the, the separate offices of uh, king and high priest were going to be combined. They're not going to exist separately anymore. And, uh, and Jesus is a prophet. You know, we... A prophet sometimes uh, foretells things, but most of the time a prophet tells forth things. He, he proclaims what God has told him to proclaim. In uh, chapter 5, we have the sixth vision. Then I turned and raised my eyes and saw there flying scroll. Now, you know what a you know, they didn't have books like we have. You know, they never saw anything like this. They had, uh, their writings were on scrolls or parchment or vellum or some sort of deal like that. And they had, uh, they were, had two sticks, I guess I'd call them. They were rolled around. And if you want to read it, you have to roll it onto one and off the other. And, of course, the materials back then were so expensive that they wrote on the front and back. So, and they wrote, if you've ever seen one of these scrolls, you can, at least me with my eyes now, you know, something I can see now, but you could barely read it. It was very, very small. But nevertheless, uh, he, he turned and raised his eyes and saw there a flying scroll. Uh, you know, I, I suppose it's suspended in air and it was going from one place to the other. Uh, and he said to me, what do you see? And I, so I answered, and I see a flying scroll. Its length is 20 cubits, cubits, and it's width 10 cubits. Now, what does the size represent? It's just, it's large, you know, it's the same size as uh, what's sometimes called Solomon's porch or Solomon's vestibule. Uh, it's, it's a large scroll. And he said to me in verse 3, this is the curse that goes over out over the face of the whole earth. Every thief shall be expelled according to what is on this side of the scroll. And every perjurer shall be expelled according to what is on that side of it. And you think about uh, a thief. A thief expropriates material things. Um, but a perjurer doesn't take anything except he lies. So they're different in that concept. One deals in the material and the other one doesn't. 
but they're both condemned by this scroll. One is is uh, curses on one side of the per of the uh, uh, thief, and, and the, the other side curses the perjurer. So it really covers all aspects of human uh, behavior. Then he said to me, in verse 3, this is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole earth. Every thief shall be expelled according to what is on this side of the scroll, and every perjurer expelled according to what is on that side. So it really covers all human behavior. He said, I will send out the uh, uh, curse, says the Lord of hosts, it shall enter the house of the thief and the house of the one who swears falsely by my name. That's the perjurer. Uh, you know, both are, are condemned. It shall remain in the midst of his house and consume it with his timber and stones. Now you think about how uh, the uh, thieves and perjurers, you know, Israel or Judah, where they were condemned because of their thieving. You know, they're taking all the uh, possessions from the poor and what have you. And they're uh, lying, they're perjury. <clears throat> and what was their curse? Well, there's both the uh, Assyrian captivity in the case of the nation of Israel and the Babylonian captivity in the uh, uh, case of, of Judah. So they were consumed by it. So that's the idea of the flying scroll. Now they've already been through this. This is after the uh, they've already returned from captivity. But he's reminding them of what had happened because of their thievery and their uh, perjury. The seventh vision <clears throat> and it begins in verse 5, Then the angel who talked with me came out and said to me, Lift your eyes now and see what this that goes forth. So I asked, What is it? And he said, It is a basket. If you've got the King James or the ASV, it says Ephra. Uh, and really, Ephra is a, is a weight it's a, but that was never used. It was going to be talking about uh, this container. Just think of it as a container. It it only held about a little bit less than forty quarts, and we'll see that this may be a little small for what it contains. But but don't think of it as a particular volume. Uh, you know, uh, of the normal Ephra is just a, it's more descriptive of the container itself, not how big it is. He said, uh, New King James, of course, it is a basket that is going forth. He also said, this is their resemblance throughout the earth. And we'll see, really, he's talking about uh, this is wickedness because that's what's contained in the basket. He said, here's a lead <coughs> disc and I think uh, again King James and uh, ASV may use talent <coughs> but again that was not used with respect to lead. He said, this is a woman sitting inside the basket so there's some, some woman's I don't know if she's curled up or exactly how she fits in that basket, but she's sitting in it. Somehow or another, she's sitting in it. So it's not just a normal, uh, uh, you know, 40-quart basket. It's got to be larger than that. So just think of it as a basket. Here is the uh, lead disc he lifted up, and this is a woman sitting inside the basket. So. Uh, Zechariah here takes a peek in the basket. There's a woman there. 
Then he said, this is wickedness. And he thrust her down into the basket and threw the lead cover over its mouth. So he didn't have to look long to figure out what it was and he knew it was time to close the lid. But uh, he said, then I raised my eyes, verse eight, uh, verse nine, then I raised my eyes and looked and there were two women coming with wind in their wings and the wind, of course, gives lift to the wings. Uh, they had wings like the wings of a stork, which is a big bird, and so it's, it, it's saying that the wings were very strong and going to need to be strong. And they lifted up the basket between earth and heaven. So it's, it's flying. It's in the sky, you know, between the heaven in the earth, that's the sky. So I said to the angel who talked with me, where are they carrying the basket? And she, he said to me, uh, to build a house for it in the land of uh, Shinar. Now Shinar is a city that was built by Nimrod, if you go back to the Old Testament, we're in the Old Testament, but further back in the Old Testament, it was a city built by uh, Nimrod, uh, Nimrod, and it was a place of evil. So this taking of wickedness is in the basket, and the these two women with wings carry the basket to Shinar, which is a place of evil. And they set the basket down there on its base so that that has the idea that there's going to be a complete removal of wickedness from God's land. And But we know that the physical land of Israel, Judah, uh, the evil was not removed from that land. In fact, uh, Jerusalem was eventually destroyed. But when it comes to his spiritual land, there will be no evil in his spiritual land. And where is the spiritual land today? It's, it's the church. There is no evil in the spiritual church. It eventually will all go away. Evil cannot exist in the presence of God. So whenever the church is delivered up, in the final day, there will be no evil there. In chapter 6, we have the eighth and last vision. Then I turned and raised my eyes and looked, and behold, four chariots were coming from between two mountains, and the mountains were of bronze or brass. Bronze is probably a better word to use. It's stronger than brass. But the first chariot were red horses. And I have no idea what red horses look like except they're red. With the second chariot, black horses. And with the third chariot, white horses. And with the fourth chariot, dappled horses strong steeds, and I assume that the strong steeds apply to the dappled horses. Now, what are the meaning of these horses? I can't say definitively, but if we go over to Revelation chapter 6, we might just turn over there. Um, Revelation chapter 6. And it says there, uh, when I opened up the, when I, now I saw when the Lamb opened up uh, one of the seals, I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, come and see and look and behold a white horse and he who sat up on it had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. So that may be that 
the white horse is representative of of um, uh, conquering victory. Uh, you know, engaging in warfare and and, uh, and winning. In verse three, he says, "When he opened the second seal, I heard him saying." Now they heard the second living creature, that's the four, of the four living creatures, saying, come and see. And another horse, fiery red. Now, not only is it red, but it's fiery red. I, I guess that means fire engine red. I'm not sure. But went out and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth and that people should kill one another. And there was giving to him a great sword. So the red horse here, anyway, represents... Uh, Warfare and shedding of blood and and so forth. And when he opened the third seal, I heard the living the third living creature say, "Come and see." And look, behold, a black horse. And he who sat upon it had a pair of scales in his hand. You know, the scales were weighing out food. You know, you had to weigh on one end, you put the food in the other, and that's how you buy the food. Uh, and I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a Daenerys, and three quarts of barley for a Daenerys, and do not harm the oil and the wine. So that has the idea that the third, this third horse, the uh, uh, black horse, is going to cause famine and, and uh, what and stuff like that. And when he opened the fourth seal, it, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come and see. And I looked and behold, a pale horse. Is a pale horse a dappled horse? I don't know. I don't, know. <laughs> I don't even know what a pale horse is. It was pale. And the name of him who sat on it was Death. And Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beast of the earth. So the pale horse horse represented death so does the dappled horse represent death you know that this is just an idea that you can consider as to what these uh, um, four horses here represent um, Let's see here. Oh, we, that was the last bell, wasn't it? Oh, <laughs> okay. We'll we'll get back to the uh, four chariots next week. <laughs>